Okay, welcome to Come Follow Me, week 25 of the Old Testament. Today we're finishing off the first book of Samuel. The first three or four books are not really in our reading assignment, but I'll just cover them quickly. In Samuel 4, the Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant. Eli dies. The Philistines and the Ark have a negative encounter. The Ark then is returned to Israel. And Samuel judges Israel. You can see here that Israel and Philistia are very close to each other and they're constantly at war. In 4 3, it talks about the Philistines winning the war that was against Israel. So they decide to fetch the Ark of the Covenant out of Shiloh, where it's usually held. And they'll put it in front of their army, and then that way they figure that they'll be able to win. They figured it was just the power of the Lord and had nothing to do with their righteousness and whether or not they obeyed the commandments. So they go out from Shiloh, and they have a battle, and lose again. The Philistines take the Ark of the Covenant back to one of their major cities in Ashdod, and they put it in the temple there, but every morning when they wake up, more and more things are destroyed at the temple. The grain is being eaten and overrun by mice. And they're actually cursed with hemorrhoids. So they move it to other cities around uh, Philistine, and the same thing happens in each city. So then they decide they'd better return it. They attach it to... A cart pulled by two cows who have recently given birth and they take away their young calves and see which, what will happen. They figure if the Lord really is powerful that it will go back to Shiloh, which is really the wrong way. If not, that they'll go searching for their calves. And so it immediately goes back to Shiloh. And the men there take it in just before Shiloh and they look inside of it. And a bunch of them die. It says 50,000 in the scriptures. But the Old Testament seminary manual says the 50,000 men appears to be an added phrase or gloss. Both the Septuagint and Josephus say it was just 70 men. Included with the Ark of the Covenant that came back were five golden mice and a bunch of golden hemorrhoids. I didn't show those to you. For Samuel 7, although the Philistines returned the ark, they continued to be a threat to the Israelites. Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, put away your strange gods, prepare your hearts, and serve him, he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Baalim and Ashtaroth, and served the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. So they all gather at Mizpah. So we're at chapter 8. Samuel's sons are taking bribes and perverting judgment. Israelites want a king. Samuel's old and his sons should really judge over Israel, but the people don't really trust them because they're not good kids. His sons walk not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre which is money, and took bribes and perverted judgment. So they all gathered together, and they talked to Samuel and say, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king, so they can be like other nations. This thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge over us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto him, Hearken unto the voice of the people, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. He's told to warn them. So he says, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He'll take your sons and appoint them for different things, chariots, horsemen, warriors, captains. And he'll take your daughters and turn them into cooks and bakers down there at the palace. He will take your fields, your vineyards, your olive yards, even the best, and give them to his servants. He'll take a tenth. So he's going to take a tithe, not only for the Lord, but a tenth for him as a tax. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, 
but the Lord will not hear you. So he gives him a stiff warning. But in verse 19, Nevertheless, the people refuse to obey the voice of Samuel, and they say, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go up before us and fight our battles. From Ezra Taft Benson, Sometimes God temporarily grants to men their unwise requests in order that they might learn from their own sad experiences. Some refer to this as the Samuel principle. The children of Israel wanted a king like all the other nations. The prophet Samuel was displeased and praised to the Lord about it. The Lord responded by saying, Samuel, they haven't rejected you, but they've rejected me. The Lord told Samuel to warn the people. He gave them the warning. They still insisted, so God gave them a king and let them suffer. Sometimes in our attempts to mimic the world and contrary to the prophet's counsel, we run after the world's false educational, political, musical, and dress ideas. New worldly standards take over. A gradual breakdown occurs, and finally, after much suffering, a humble people are ready to be taught, once again, a higher law. Chapter 9 gives us a little bit more information about Saul. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, and he had a bunch of sons. One of them was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly man. Now this word goodly, we've encountered it before in Genesis and Exodus, and it means handsome or extremely attractive. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. So he was handsome and he was very tall compared to them. We have a whole incident here with a bunch of lost donkeys from his father. So he goes looking for the donkeys and the Lord tells Samuel, tomorrow about this time, I will send thee out a man out of the land of Benjamin and thou shalt appoint him to be a captain or king over my people, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, and because their cries come unto me. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spoke to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. When Saul was out with his servants looking for the donkeys, they couldn't find them. And so his servants suggested that they talked to Samuel because he was a prophet and he could tell them. So the Lord already told Samuel that they were coming. So when they approach, Samuel says, As for thy donkeys that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are already found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on thy father's house? Even before Saul can say anything, Samuel says to him, Don't worry about the donkeys, they've already been found. And then he tells him that Israel wants a king, and it's him, that he, was, that he will be the king. And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? Remember what happened to the tribes of Israel a couple of weeks ago where they were almost wiped out because of the atrocities of that city. And my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin, wherefore then speakest thou so to me? So we can see here that Samuel truly is quite humble, He's realizing that he's nothing and that, why have you chosen me? From Dieter F. Uchtdorf, if we look at ourselves only through our mortal eyes, we may not see ourselves as good enough, but our Heavenly Father sees us as who we truly are and who we can become. You can see in this painting that Saul is actually quite a bit taller than everybody else. From the Old Testament Seminary Manual, Samuel anointed Saul to be the king by applying oil to his head. The Lord gave Saul another heart, which means that Saul was spiritually reborn. Sometime after Saul's appointment as king of Israel, the Ammonites threatened to attack some Israelites living east of the Jordan River. Saul, being led by the Spirit, rallied the Israelites to battle and successfully defeated the Ammonites. Samuel then gathered the people and confirmed Saul as their king before the Lord. Samuel testified that the Lord was Israel's true leader and warned the Israelites that if they did not obey the Lord, that they would be destroyed. There's also an incident in Samuel 10 where Saul is hanging out with the sons of the prophets. 
This is kind of like the school of the prophets that we learned about from Joseph Smith. And they are a little perplexed because he was able to prophesy as well. And then some of them question as to whether or not he should be king and whether he'll be able to save them. But then in Samuel 11, after Saul's victory over the Ammonites, the people said unto Samuel, Who is he that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring that man, that we might put them to death. And Saul said, No, there shall not a man be put to death this day. So we can see that in the beginning, Saul is quite a righteous man. Chapter 13. This is where Saul starts to go downhill. He's reigned for a couple of years. And they're in difficult times. In verse 6 here, we find the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait. People are distressed. They're being attacked again, and the people hide in caves and rocks and high places. Some of them even go over the Jordan River to the land of Gad and Gilead. But Saul's waiting in Gilgal, and he tarries there for seven days, according to the time that was set by Samuel the prophet, who was going to come there and offer sacrifice for them. But Samuel is late in coming, and Saul is worried because they're under attack. The people are scattering, and he decides in verse 9, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and a peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. It came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering, behold, Samuel came. So Saul goes out to salute him, and Samuel says, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together, he sacrificed. So it's not his fault. It's the people's fault. They were scattering. It's Samuel's fault because he didn't come on time. And it's the Philistines' fault because they're going to attack. Verse 12, Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, he rationalized it, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be a captain or king over this people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So he loses his kingdom, not right away, but upon his death, his sons will not be able to inherit it. From the Old Testament Institute Manual, think also of Saul, who had been called from the field to be a king of the nation. When the Philistines were marshaled against Israel in Michmash, Saul waited for Samuel, under whose hand he had received his kingly anointing, and to whom he had looked in the days of humility for guidance. He asked that the people come and offer sacrifice to the Lord on behalf of the people. But growing impatient at Samuel's delay, Saul prepared the burnt offering himself, forgetting that though he occupied the throne, wore the crown, and bore the scepter, these insignia of kingly power gave him no right to officiate even as a deacon in the priesthood of God. And for this and other instances of his unrighteous presumption, he was rejected of God, and another was made king in his place. Chapter 14. This is a story about Jonathan and how courageous he was in smiting the Philistines. Now his father and the people didn't realize what he was doing, but he decided to do a little bit of a covert operation. And so he and his armor bearer are in the valley, and there is an outpost on the hilltop of Philistines. And Jonathan says to his armor bearer, Come and let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or few. So even though there are only two of us against the whole garrison, and we learn later that the garrison comprised of more than 20 people, they decide on a stratagem to sneak up as close as they can get, that when they're seen, depending on what, the Philistines say they will know whether the Lord wants them to continue. So when they're discovered, the Philistines say, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they have hid themselves. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer, Come up to us. And that was the sign that they had decided that the 
the Lord would be with them. So they climb up the steep area and they start fighting. And that first slaughter, this is verse 14, which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men. So they're fighting uphill against an overpowering force and they win. And then in verse 15, we find that there's an earthquake and the earthquake signals to the Philistines that they're in trouble. And so they flee. Plus the fact that 20 of them just got killed by two didn't help them any. When they get back to report what's happened, unknown to Jonathan, Saul, his father, had indicated that for that day nobody was to eat. They were fasting. And he had unknowingly broken that rule by eating some honey. And so the king decided that he should die. But the people saved Jonathan saying, how can you kill him? He was responsible for initiating this great victory. Chapter 15, Saul's commanded to destroy the Amalekites. And if you remember, this is verse 2, the Amalekites had attacked Moses and the children of Israel as they were coming out of Egypt. And they were very sneaky and attacking in the back for those who were delayed. And so the Amalekites were considered a murderous people and were enemies of the Lord. And so the Lord tells them to utterly destroy the Amalekites. That means everybody and everything. So Saul smites the Amalekites and he takes the king captive and he destroys the rest of the people. But in verse 9, Saul and the people spared the king and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good. Then came the word of the, of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, In here it says, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. But if you look at the Joseph Smith translation, he says, I have set up Saul to be a king, and he repenteth not that he had sinned. Remember, he had all those excuses. It wasn't his fault. It was the people's fault. It was Samuel's fault. It was the Philistines' fault. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. So Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel says, well, What meaneth then these bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them forth from the Amalekites, meaning the people. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord. The rest we utterly destroyed. And Samuel says to Saul, The Lord sent you to destroy them completely. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? And didst fly upon the spoils? And didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and I have brought Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. The people took the spoil of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord. Verse 22 is a very famous scripture where Samuel replies, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Then he goes on in verse 23 to say, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. So we see here that Saul is now on a real spiral downward. Chapter 16, the Lord chooses David as king. So Samuel goes, as he's directed, to find a new king. When they were come, that he looked upon one of the sons of Jesse, where he was sent. And he thinks to himself, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord says to him, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. From Marvin J. Ashton. When the Lord measures an individual, he measures the heart as an indicator of the person's capacity and potential to bless others. Why the heart? Because the heart is a synonym for one's entire makeup. The measure of our hearts is a measure of our total performance. 
As used by the Lord, the heart of a person describes his effort to better himself or others or the conditions he confronts. So in verse 10, Jesse makes seven more of his sons pass before Samuel. And yet Samuel says, the Lord hath not chosen these. Are here all thy children? And he said, there remaineth yet the youngest. Behold, he keepeth the sheep. And so they send for him. And when he's brought, he was ruddy and of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look upon. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. So Samuel takes the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went to Ramah. Now, the only people that were ever anointed with oil at this time were either priests or kings. Verse 14 is interesting. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Of course, Joseph Smith corrected this scripture to say, an evil spirit which was not of the Lord troubled him. Because Saul became very troubled, one of his servants suggests that someone be called to play the harp and sing for him. Then he specifically suggests David, who is cunning in playing and a mighty valiant man, a man of war, prudent in matters, a comely person, and the Lord is with him. So David comes to play and to sing for Saul, who's becoming more and more troubled. Chapter 17, Israel and Philistine, and the Philistines are in war again. And this is the famous story of David and Goliath. Now, the armies of the Philistines are camped on one side of a deep valley, and Saul and his armies are camped on the other side, and neither of them can get a strategic advantage. So, there, in verse 4, there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistine named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. So, this would make him over eight feet tall, possibly nine feet tall. He was very tall. He had a helmet of brass and a coat of mail that were very heavy. He had greaves of brass which protected his shins, a target of brass which protected his neck, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and he had somebody to carry his shield, which was almost as large as that person. So he's quite large and very well armored. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come down. And so he's recommending, because they're at an impasse, that they're, that two individuals fight. And the winner takes all. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against them and kill him, and ye shall be our servants and serve us. And then he says, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight. And Saul, now remember Saul was head and shoulders taller than everybody. But Goliath was significantly taller than even Saul. So they're dismayed and greatly afraid. Then you know the story. David's father sends him to check on the boys and bring him some food. And the men of Israel say, Have you seen this man that has come up? They're speaking to David, surely to defy Israel. He has come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with, a great, with great riches, and will give him his daughter. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to a man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? So David says to Saul, let no man's heart fail them. Thy servant, meaning him, meaning David, will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this, of this Philistine. And Saul said, Go, and the Lord be with thee. He took his staff in his hand, and he chose five smooth stones out of the brook, 
He put them in his shepherd's bag, and then he went to fight with the Philistine. When the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance, a pretty boy. <laughs> so Goliath is a warrior, probably has lots of scars, and here comes this young, pretty guy to fight him. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Verse 45 is very famous, where David says to him, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And verse 47, For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So Goliath comes towards him. David runs towards Goliath, puts his hand in his bag, takes out a stone and slings it and hits Goliath right in the forehead, and he falls down. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. This is verse 50. Smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine, took out his sword and drew it out of the sheath and slew him and cut off his head. So then the Philistines, when they see it, they run. Chapter 18. Here we learn a little bit more about Jonathan and that Saul sets David as a general over the army. So he takes him into his household. It came to pass that when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women came out of the cities singing and dancing to meet the king. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more than the kingdom? So he becomes very jealous. He continues his spiral downhill. Remember Saul started off so humble and so willing to obey? It reminds me of that saying that, Absolute power corrupts absolutely. So Saul has let things get to him. Verse 14, And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, because he went out and came in before them. So in Samuel 19, we find that Saul tries to kill David out of jealousy, and his son Jonathan warns David. And then David has an incident where Saul is chasing him and trying to kill him. And his men are hungry and fleeing. They are fed holy bread by the priests. And then they flee to the Philistine area and hide in a cave. Then Saul kills the priests who help David in chapter 22. Chapter 23, David saves one of the cities of Israel that borders on the Philistine area. Saul finds out he's there and pursues him, and David again has an opportunity to kill him but doesn't. So here we have just a graphic of Saul searching for David. It happened to shelter in the same cave, only David's deeper in the cave, and he sees the king there, and he comes and cuts off the hem of his garment while he's sleeping. And then in the morning when they've escaped, he yells across the valley that he could have killed them. And here's the proof. What I cut off from you, from the bottom of your garment, but I did not kill you because you are the Lord's anointed. Then we get into chapter 25. Samuel the prophet dies. And we have an incident between David and Nabal. David is hiding from Saul, who continually seeks him. And he's in the wilderness of Paran. 
And there was a man there whose possessions were in Carmel and were very great. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. The name of this man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of beautiful countenance. But the man was Kurlish. So Kurlish is not really a word that we use very often anymore in English. I went back to the Hebrew, where it means cruel, grievous, hard-hearted, impudent, obstinate, stiff-necked. And this man is very rude to David's men who are hiding in the area where Nabal keeps all of his flocks. And David's been very particular to tell them not to touch anything that's not theirs. But after he hears the report, how rude he was to his men, he says, gird up everyone their sword. He had about 400 men that went up to go against this rude fellow and left 200 to guard their stuff. One of the servants of Abigail tells her that David is coming, that he sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute his, her husband, and he acted very poorly towards them. Verse 17, Now therefore no one consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such a son of Belial. Now remember we talked about this, and I called him a bozo. The actual term means worthless, the quality of, a, of being useless, good for nothing. So I guess that is a bozo. Verse 18, Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves, two bottles of wine, five sheep, already dressed and ready to eat, and five measures of grain and a hundred clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, and put them on donkeys and said unto her servants, Go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. So she takes all of these supplies to David. She falls down on her face before him and says, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. So she's taking responsibility for what her bozo husband did. And that, my Lord, I pray that you regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young man of thy, my Lord, whom thou didst send. So she's making a rather dramatic apology. And David says to her, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to me. Blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hast haste and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning. And then he uses an idiom that says he would have killed all the men. It came to pass that after ten days, the Lord smote Nabal and he dies. And 39 is very interesting. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the case of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. But he knew a good thing when he saw one, and he sent and communed with Abigail, and took her to him to wife. She's a good woman. Then we have another incident where David could kill Saul. Saul continues to look for him, to try to kill him, and he stops his servant from doing it. So he spares his life again in 26 and 27. He runs to live with the Philistines. In 28, Saul consults with a sorceress. Now remember, he used to have the Spirit of the Lord, but he lost it. In 29, the war continues, and David's going to fight with the Philistines, but they reject him. Then David's wives are captured by the Amalekites and taken away, so David has to go and rescue them. Then in 31, Saul dies. Let's just briefly cover what happens in 28. Saul inquires of the witch of Endor for revelation, because he wants to know what's going to happen with the Philistines. She foretells his death and the death of his sons, and the defeat of Israel by the Philistines. From the seminary manual, this is actually quoting Joseph Fielding Smith, despite what she said, it is not possible for a person like this woman to be able to summon the spirits of the Lord's departed servants. 
She either pretended to see Samuel or was under the influence of evil powers when she delivered her message to Saul. In Samuel 31, we find the Philistines again at war and the Israelites are losing. And then in verse 3, the battle went sore against Saul and the archers hit him and he was sorely wounded of the archers. And so rather than be captured, he asks his servant to kill him. He won't do it because he's the anointed of the Lord. And so Saul falls upon his sword and kills himself. Okay, that's the end of 1 Samuel. I know we went through it quite quickly for 30 chapters. Only a chapter per minute approximately. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope that you enjoy your reading more in detail this week. And I will see you on Thursday. Have a great week.